Thank you very much, and um, welcome everyone to uh, Feminist Techno Science and Hybrid Art. First technical question, can you hear me well? Is it loud enough? Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I'd like to elaborate with you in my talk. I want a time. I'd like to elaborate with you about the term of hybrid arts. And uh, with this field in the last 10, 15 years that I have theoretically elaborated and practically at Art Laboratory Berlin, I call this field hybrid art history. And with this hybrid art, we have a lot of material agency connected, biomaterial, technological material, really challenged, challenging the scientific disciplines from so-called hybrid artists, very often also called bio-artists. So we find here critically exploring science and technology, artists working with living material, working in labs. The work in progress is a very important parameter, process-oriented work, projects that are complex, take time. And the last term I refer to the artist Mary Magic. This is actually hybrid art is a genre we could say that very much does not only take place in exhibition halls, but is actually understood as a very broad, radically challenging the disciplines. It can be also a workshop. So we call about workshopologies. So hybrid art history is a term that I coined based on hybrid art. And with this together, we find the term non-human subjectivities. And this uh, concept that my partner, Christian de Lutz and me, um, have invented six years, seven years ago, when we invited um, artistic research to Art Laboratory Berlin that critically questions humanism and basically wanted to decenter the human to, un to understand what it means that we all live in symbiosis, in coexistences on the planet, basically in the idea of a posthumanist understanding of um, coexistences. And with this, I'd like to show you um, and present you a few artists. I just brought four artistic positions with me. There would be a dozens, but um, time is short and we also wanted to have a Q&A later on. You can see already materials, um, fungi, algae, rice, mycelium, slime mold, but one of them I will show you in a little while. And Art Laboratory is basically the hub that Jochen already mentioned earlier, that we co-founded in 2006, and you're very welcome to visit and to co-create. You also visit virtually and our web archive. We share a lot of knowledges, and as I said, we discuss 21st century topics over through the arts, through the hybrid art, and we do not have only exhibitions and workshops and conferences, we share everything that we do with the public. And um, about publications, I will let you know later in my talk. And um, let's come to the first position, the very interesting American-Chinese artist, Vivian Zhu, and I would call this chapter Technoscience and Non-Human Subjectivities. So Vivian Zhu is a media artist and researcher, now based in Chicago, formerly in Shanghai, and her work is situated between bio and electronic media in creating new forms of machine logic, life and sensory systems. Very often takes the form of object installation or wearable, and we're gonna see some wearables in a minute. In the Silkworm project, which um, she would elaborate in the conference Non-Human Agents in 2017, and then later on in an artist residency that we organized for Vivian in Berlin in 2019, uh, in this project, Silkworm project, um, Vivian explores the possibilities of using silkworms to design a series of hybrid machines capable of producing self-organized 2D and 3D silk structures. 
the artist wants to understand how far the behavior of insects can serve as a foundation for technological design. To this end, she has developed cybernetic devices based on both biological and computer-controlled logic. The artist designer works on the creation of self-organized silk structures designed by live silkworms. Basically, what she calls this is a post-human machine. And so we see here, she had earlier prototypes, she had a flat spinning, she had a spatial spinning machine. What we see here is basically machine number three, a um, magnetic spinning machine. And in this prototype, um, it stresses a hybrid bionic perspective that is speculative in its nature. On one level, it tries to think about how we design systems and machines. So it's also almost resembling a space capsule and elliptical and planetary in its shape, as if rotating in its own little orbit. And neither fully machine-like nor purely biological, it is hybrid. The machine aims to disrupt the insect's equilibrium, introduce confusion, and track the silkworm's perceptual blind spots through the spun silk structures. So this machine uses curved surfaces to challenge the silkworm, which usually uses corners and angles to anchor its structures. So Vivinju's silkworm project posits a posthuman question of autonomous biofabrication, and this question is really noteworthy. How can creatures and machines function together to weave new biomaterials? Well, I'd like to also show you today um, some images from Vivian Ju's skin series that she started in 2016. And the question here for was for Vivian, how can the possibilities of wearable technology reinvent our relationships with our environments? So she really wants to come from a non-human perspective here. And the skin series uses the skin as an interface and field of experimentation and proposes the concept of wearables as prosthetic extensions. The series currently consists of two works. We see here the electric skin. I'm going to show you the sonic skin in a little moment. And it explores possible forms of co-evolution between humans and technologies by understanding both as hybrid communication systems. In doing so, Ju draws attention to the role of environmental influences on our sensory perception, which in turn changes our human behavior. So the invisible landscape of electromagnetic signals has changed dramatically with the development and spread of electronic technologies. But as our living spaces change through and with technology, are we ready, as the artist would ask, are we ready to change in the same way? So here you see the electronic skin from 2016, which is a wearable that extends the functionality of the skin to detect electro electrostatic movements in the environment and convert this information into touch sensations. So you see here the hand to the right, and you would get a little current actually while you touch the tips of the needles. Well, then you find here the sonic skin. Sorry, I brought mute images along here. Sonic Skin from 2018, also a wearable work of sound art. The garment designed and realized by Ju incorporates an audio controller and an ultrasonic transducer. Sonic Skin can be understood as an artificial second skin that the artist designed to, pro to project direct directional sounds similar to a BETS sonar system. So Vivian would understand basically to create the garment for humans to understand animals' perception. Uh, so the sonic skin explores the relationships between body movement and space and asks whether human sensitivity and sensory systems can be enhanced in the future with the help of wearable technology. Ju takes a biomimetic approach and links this with research from the behavioral sciences and sensory ecologies. And then in the context of Under the Virus Shadow, networks in the age of technoscience and infection. That was actually the research project at Adlerbetur Berlin in 2021 um, that we um, basically invited and showed this in um, series and also in the conference invited Vivian to elaborate, to speak about it. And also 
um, there are some publications where I wrote about Vivian's work and also I wrote about coexistence in um, 2022. I'd like to elaborate a little bit about a very interesting artist from Indonesia. I think we have her here with us, Irin Agrivin. Uh, born and raised in Java, Indonesia, where the practice of science, myth, and traditional um, approaches sometimes mixed into one. The artist Irene Agrivina is a founding member of the famous Honf Collective, as well as XX Lab, which was awarded the Next Idea Art and Technology Grant by Ars Electronica eight years ago. And as an artist and technologist and educator, Irene works at the intersection between art, science and technology and is engaged in collaborative cross-disciplinary and multimedia actions responding to social, cultural and environmental challenges. And maybe with this um, example, we can really understand well that here are approaches beyond the Western <laughs> traditional sciences, and here comes different parameters together. So here she combines in the work Entangled Beauty, A Perfect Marriage. The artist combines traditional Indonesian farming practice, art, and biology to create an installation that is also a power source, we could say a biobattery. It brings together water fern plants with cyanobacteria. So what you would have, and I think the next image would show it better here in these containers, in the three containers. We have here a mutual symbiosis of the two species, Azola, so it's a fern, and Anabena, a cyanobacteria, also known as blue algae. Yeah, so they create a photosynthesis and uh, we could say photosynthetic process that functions as a biofertilizer, a water purifier, food for humans and non-humans, eco-friendly textile dials, and even biofuel. So what we have here is an exemplary installation we could really understand as a very broad natural tool, also actually for rice fields, as, a, as a, against pesticides. And, um, and then actually the artist also carried out, next to the biotechnological research, she carried out anthropological research about the connection between human culture and the environment, drawing upon myths about the, about the goddess of fertility, known in Java as a Divi Sri, or the Mekwan Kao, or the Fosop in Thailand, or the Nang Hosop in Laos, or Po Naga in Vietnam and Cambodia. So it's a beautiful goddess from the sky that fall down to earth and her body becomes varieties of plants. So this is actually the connection that I think you can see here very well with the image and the biotechnological situation. Irene also was at one of our conferences. It was the project Hackers, Makers, Thinkers that we co-curated and co-conceived here. My colleagues are with me, Tuche Erel and Christian Deleuze, and uh, also together with um, Philippine curator Tenga Drilon. And if you're interested, as I said, all the video recordings of the conferences, they're all there. I would like to elaborate about the Canadian artist, White Feather Hunter, who is very much challenging traditional Western sciences with a very simple material, with a material that we would find everywhere where humans are, everywhere where menstruating bodies are, a material that we do not have to buy, a material that is regularly produced, menstrual blood. So this is actually the basis of the project The Witch in the Lab Coat from Canadian artist White Feather Hunter. And that's also a PhD research project uh, that explored gender and taboo in the life sciences. The work examines the lack of research, until recently, into the use of menstrual blood in the field of medical biotechnology. Maybe we would have to say Western medical biotechnology. The artist notes, as does recent scientific research, that menstrual blood is not only a valuable source of stem cells, but that menstrual blood also contains 
I quote her, hundreds of proteins not found in venous blood. End of quote. So here we could actually make a connection to biologist, historian of science, and philosopher Donna Haraway with the notion of situated knowledge. And even if this essay is already more than 30, 40 years old, we might find a contemporariness. Because here, what White Feather Hunter does, and I will show you details in a second, is there's modern science, which is still male-dominated, that has continued to treat menstrual blood as dirty, without fully investigating whether this is in fact the case. So, from her research, the artist has produced um, a vast um, amount of um, projects, formats, genre, bio-art coven meetings during the COVID pandemic, and different um, speculative objects derived from menstrual uh, stem cells. And so this is the interesting moment now. Whitefeather Hunter knows very well the science that she's involved with. She's able to work in the labs. And that's the fascinating point, that you find very often with hybrid artists. It's not about pseudoscience, not so much about science fiction. It's really that hybrid artist would challenge contemporary scientific research. So the installation, I want to show you a little bit of a detail. We come further to the bioreactor. So the installation is actually on a plinth. It looks rather traditional, but if we would open the plinth, there's a whole, <laughs> a whole little lab in it, basically. pH measure, um, uh, also the temperature uh, measure, etc. But actually, it comes along maybe rather traditional. It's also these glass. Um, here's a detail. Um, the glass chambers are produced by a glass artist Emma Lashar. Don't want to let her unmentioned. And with this, with, within this installation here, we can call um, this installation a living bioreactor. Mm -hmm. And it um, has tubing holding the stem cells and nutrients which are pumped through the sculpture and the DIY incubator. So the complexity is not only to have living cells in the exhibition space, this is challenging for curating hybrid art, but how to maneuver the living cells from Perth, Western Australia, from Symbiotica, the Center of Excellence in Biological Arts at the University of Western Australia, to Berlin. That was challenging. And that is also part of this complexity when hybrid artists want to work with scientific, um, in a scientific context. So, packed on ice, it was possible. Just in time, it arrived. And then in Berlin, we were very lucky to have a lab that we collaborated. We is Tuche, Chris, and I as curators. And we were very lucky to have the laboratory of Dr. Susanne Wegmann at the Deutsches Zentrum für Neurodegenerative Erkrankung. So it's a German center for neurodegenerative diseases. It's um, on the Charité campus. So, what happened during this exhibition, we already had the idea it could happen, but it was really interesting, so it was basically a leakage happened. But this is then also really challenging. So we can say during the exhibition time, stem cell colonies grew in the several vessels, noticeable as a translucent white sediment, so what you see with the red is actually only the, the nutrient medium, it's, it's not the blood. Yeah? But what happened then, two, three weeks into the exhibition, um, we had neighbors. This is why we live here in coexistence, microbiomes. Yeah? We have uh, fungi who are coming and having a party in the bioreactor. So yeast was found and growing in the bioreactor, and five weeks finally into the exhibition, we had to actually close the installation. But that was part of the project. Yeah? Um, so we, as team members and the artist, remotely present by video feed, we also performed a wake for the stem cells, which slowly died over the remainder of the exhibition. So we could say that this project explores menstrual blood as a reference point 
Yeah? It defied science literally, situating the latter within the field of misogyny, patriarchy, and capitalism. And I'd like to show you my last um, artistic example. Lindsay Walsh, an artist from New York based in Berlin currently, and I would call this chapter maybe permeabilities of body politics of care. And um, this, the, the project self-care, can you read the title here? This is the center here. So in this project, living cellular agents and closely interwoven with the artist's own autobiographical context. So what Lindsay would do here is um, an autoethnographical examination. And the artwork radically challenges the conventional binary dichotomies of bodily health. It basic, the artwork basically <laughs> challenges all binary borders between diseased, healthy, between male, female, between in or out, between on and off. And I just switched to this image because that's the centerpiece here. It's a custom-made wearable chest binder that houses a living breast cancer cell line with the same genetic mutation as Walsh. So Lindsay has a high probability because of that gene mutation of getting cancer, breast cancer, ovary cancer or other. And this is the basis for this examination. So the wearable is made out of silicone and carries two pockets that are soft pouches containing the living cells. But I mean, for this project, uh, Lindsay would use the cell line HCC1937 that is collected in 95 from the 19-year-old white woman with stage 2B breast cancer. But in the future, Lindsay wants to examine um, and create cancer cells on the, with a biopsy on the level of from her own body, but that's actually in the future. Yeah. So what can you see? I hope this picture shows you clearly that there are embroidery threads in the wearable. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And specifically referencing the mastectomy scars of the artist's mother, because that gene mutation is an inheritance from the mother line. And the chest binder can be considered a strong tool for autonomous non-binary agency. The artist remarks that, and I quote, Lindsay, the very action of binding the breast as part of a non-binary identity is something that is more malleable and adaptive and actively rejects signifiers of gender. And then as well, for this um, production of the artwork, it also was, a lab was necessary, and uh, we found the Hegemann lab that, at the Department of Experimental Biophysics at the Humboldt University of Berlin. So, it's Interesting, why does the artist choose to work with living cancer cells? Yeah. It's basically, again, referencing to Donna Haraway, it's basically staying with a trouble. Yeah. In their installation, it's, um, the living cancer cells emphasize the interest in making kin with a genetic mutation. With a variable, Walsh also gets rid of the attributions of the normative demands that society has placed on them in the context of the medical gaze. I would leave um, the explanation of this work at the moment as it is, because um, I would like to show you also like more. This is part of the installation, in, including the bioreactor. I can show you the, the whole inst installation here. And talking about care, care work, this was basically the... Um, <laughs> the equipment for feeding the cells, and that was for the whole duration of the exhibition time. It was every three days that the artist would come and feed the cancer cells. That was an important detail in the artwork, because that is a, a video. Left is a video with the interview with Lindsay's mother, who had a mastectomy, breast cancer. And on the right side, I can just only reference today to it, is um, a letter that Lindsay would read with her own experience of going through as a patient through an oncological treatment, however, not yet having the breast uh, a cancer so far. 
So this is a very complex issue, and there's a lot of um, <laughs> autoethnographic approach to this. This was the exhibition spaces in the front with White Feather Hunter, in the back, Lindsay Walsh. And this is a new publication that we had just published. I'd like later on, if you want, come and grab one book. We're very happy we published it in the spring. It actually resonates also this exhibition, Matter of Flux, but then also it resonates the network, Matter of Flux, that we had built last year, Flinter in Art, Science and Technology, actually Berlin, Flinter in Art, Science and Technology. So this is actually um, the essay that Tutor Chris and me, we co-wrote. And then this here is the larger part of the publication. I want to make you very curious. <laughs> the network and the festival. And I think that um, resonates very well with the topics we have here at uh, Republica, with the melding and co-working, collaboration, cohabitation. I just wanted to show you a few excerpts from the book. So here, for instance, um, we, we met several times last year. It's, it's, it's a big endeavor, <laughs> just in Berlin, quickly build up a network of Flinter and Arts and Technology. Quick. <laughs> it's a very vast endeavor. But then Flinter would mix differently interdisciplinary work together. And it worked. And they created different clusters. And they were interdisciplinary researching. They created critical history of technology cluster. They created um, uh, cluster plant encounters, practices, sites, communication, etc. Just to make you a little bit curious at that point, and I think I will be soon done, and we have a couple of minutes of Q&A. So this is what I wanted to finish, to just visually remind you on the artistic positions I was quickly elaborating on. So that just a little bit of an example of what hybrid art could mean in the really, really vast field of hybrid art histories, that you would ha actually have a bio battery or you would have wearables, not only to in a, not in a trans-humanist understanding, but rather a post-humanist understanding, to maybe experiences from non-human perspectives, or actually dealing with um, one of the most natural human liquids and putting into a science context or with Lindsay to actually build wearables to understand one's own body history better. And with this, actually, I'd like to stop and I thank you so very much to come and to listen to me. Thank you.